welcome to Ruminant Health and Welfare, and thanks for taking time out today to, I suppose, share the results of our grassroots survey. And grassroots, you know, is, is a word that I don't particularly like, but it actually probably is the right word because the survey is all about, I suppose, gaining the experience of, of the people that work on the ground, day-to-day -day care for animals, getting their views, their experience of uh, disease challenges and problems, but also getting their views about the priorities for the future. So it's a, a really important milestone for us. I think before um, moving on to you know, the, the uh, background of the survey and our agenda today, it's, uh, I was reminded by Caroline before we started that you know, maybe you know, quite a few of you aren't aware of Ruminant Health and Welfare. And just in a few words, I'll try and give you a, a bit of a snapshot of what we are. Um, we're an independent group that straddles the four nations. And our focus is very definitely animal health and welfare. Our mission, you know, to actually accelerate or move standards forward on farm to actually see a higher levels of uh, health and welfare emerging quickly. Uh, and uh, I guess our constituency or our, our, uh, our, our focus in many ways are the farmers that, uh, uh, and those that care for animals on farm, but also the professionals that, that support that effort uh, and very especially, I suppose, farm veterinarians. So in some ways, this uh, survey is pretty fundamental to us. It's a foundation stone in that it's connecting with our, our constituency and giving us, uh, uh, I suppose, guidance as far as our priorities go, our agenda and our activity. So for the next few months and years, this is going to be a pretty important sort of uh, part of our world. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, before we... Uh, uh, you know, go too much further. It's I, I talk about this very much being in a Ruminant Health and Welfare initiative, but we wouldn't be here today without the support of HDB. And the reality is this, uh, uh, I suppose, launch is on an HD platform this morning, uh, for which we're grateful. And we've got Chloe in the background, uh, uh, you know, making sure that the, the mechanics of that work. Uh, and, uh, you know, importantly, although our own Amy Jackson, you know, had the unenviable task of of developing the, the uh, survey, taking it from vision to reality. Uh, the HDB has been really instrumental in, in collating that data and analyzing it. And Amy Brassington, who's uh, with us this morning, played a big role in that. We're great, really grateful for that. And she'll actually present that uh, report uh, in due course. So you know, just an acknowledgement for that input from HDB. Uh, the actual agenda today, is uh, you know, me giving a slight overview of, of where we are and, and uh, the background of the survey. Uh, and then we're going to move on to Amy, who's going to actually go through the report uh, and I suppose point out the highlights and some of the, the idiosyncrasies within the results. Uh, and uh, we'll go then for immediate reaction to uh, two of our student group members, Phil Stocker, and uh, uh, who's, I suppose, in many ways, the face of the sheep industry, CEO of NSA, uh, and Colin Mason, who is a board member of uh, the British Cattle Veterinary Association and has really in-depth knowledge, not just of cattle disease on farm, but in epidemiological and pathological uh, terms as well, being part of the SAC veterinary services team. So we've got some really quite interesting comment. From that, we'll, we'll actually move on to just a few words about next steps. And then we'll have an open session, which hopefully allow you to to make your comments and, and uh, you know ask questions both to uh, our panelists, I suppose Phil and Colin, but also to myself. Uh, and uh, we hope, well, I'm sure we'll fool the hour, uh, uh, and uh, uh, ho I hope leave you with a a, a really good view of, of where we've got to, and as I say, an important milestone for this organisation. Uh, the organisation itself is small. Uh, it really, uh, I suppose, consists of Caroline Slay, our Secretary General, Amy Jackson, who looks after our communication, has been instrumental in bringing the survey to life, and Gwyn and myself. So you're quite a small team. So, so that, that's the background. And then maybe it's a, worth just having a, a brief look at the background to the survey. There's two sections to it. The first section, you know, focusing on disease, which I guess is the headline. Uh, and, and I suppose mirrors you know, what other organizations have done. Uh, and the diseases we've used have been really, I suppose, borrowed to a degree from uh, our climate change reports. The ADAS report on climate change disease, you know, commissioned by DEFRA, uh, and a similar report in Scotland 
uh, commissioned by the Scottish Government, which looks not just at cattle, but at sh uh, sheep as well. Uh, and that group was chaired by uh, uh, Philip Scoos. So th that, was, that was the core of the disease group that we uh, are using. Uh, we've added one or two other gaps, diseases which we thought were gaps. And because although the survey it really focuses on uh, production uh, 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 diseases or, or production efficiency, for welfare, it also looks a little bit at uh, market access and public perception. So there are two or three diseases added in which for public health reasons or public perception reasons. Uh, and there's two, I suppose, curved balls, two which definitely aren't high prevalence diseases. Uh, and they are really, I suppose, to test the temperature about uh, what the community thinks about uh, uh, Compilobacter, which can have such a severe effects in just a few herds every year in, in reproductive performance, and also probably an import risk, uh, uh, the scab mite, seroptes and cattle. So uh, you're quite a spectrum of choices and quite a complex survey. Uh, and uh, I think that, that was very much uh, 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 Amy's challenge. The second section is about uh, syndromes. Uh, and the syndromes that we've actually defined are, are, I suppose, a little bit unconventional, a little bit messy, but they're designed to actually encapsulate peers in the production cycle. Uh, and by doing so, we think that if you look at you know, statutory data on farm or some of the normal farm management data like PD or scanning results or sale weights or sale dates, uh, we can actually screen through those and whether you be a vet or a farmer, you can actually start to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the system. And in doing so, you can actually start to identifying if there is a syndrome there, which is actually eroding performance or causing uh, welfare problems. And it's a route into, to, I suppose, active health planning. And, and, and that's the real attraction for us. And the other attraction is that if we look at diseases, even diseases like BVD, which were you know, originally acquired, you know, maybe if you actually tackled them in the national herd, you might actually improve efficiency by two or three percent. Uh, um, if we look at syndromes, actually have a far bigger percentage gain. You know, you know, maybe six or seven percent or more in, in some herds, so flocks. So this is maybe a, quite a big bang for your market, but, but it's a, a simple way into actually getting your significant gains. There are real limitations about syndromes, however. If we employ syndromes, they're unique on every farm. They're, they're, they're system based, so we're not just looking at health, we're looking at nutrition, system design, uh, I suppose environment and genetics, and all those play a part, so it's complex. Uh, so it's a unique approach that requires an investigation, and that's part of its strength because it rebases the system and maybe avoids challenges in the future. It's maybe more, but it's unique to the farm. And therefore, if we're looking, interested in national programs which can actually improve uh, uh, biosecurity, or can make safe trading, you know, uh, 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 or more open trading a possibility, or improve our status for international trading, or indeed, uh, I suppose, start to uh, address the emissions challenge that net zero and uh, uh, the net zero target and climate change throws at the ruminant sector, then syndromes don't fit with that. We have to actually look at diseases and make sure that we actually have a well-defined area of activity and a well-defined output which can be quantified and put in an inventory or have an impact right across the industry. So it's a two-strand approach. We're looking at diseases and syndromes. Both matter. Both can actually be useful. Both are essential to make progress on. So that's where our starting point is. As I say, I'm going to go to Amy now to actually take you through the report, and then we'll go straight to Phil and Colin for their reaction. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the next few minutes. I think it is fascinating. I've talked maybe a bit too much, uh, and in many ways, you know, it makes it sound a bit like a, a ruminant health and welfare agenda, but this isn't a ruminant health and welfare agenda. This is the experience uh, and the, the thoughts and the voice of those that work on the ground. And for that reason, it's definitely worth listening to. Thanks, Amy. I'll hand over to you. And uh, 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 this is a great presentation. I think you'll get real value from it. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Um, so before I present the results of the survey, I just have a couple of housekeeping things to point out to you. Um, so as usual, you'll all be muted throughout the presentation. 
However, we would welcome that you ask questions. Um, please type any questions you have into the questions box, which can be found at the right hand side of your screen at any time throughout the webinar. And if you can't see the questions box, please click on the orange arrow to open up the control panel and then click on the questions drop down and you'll see where you can type your question in there. Um, please also use this box to let us know if you're having any technical problems and we'll do our best to help. We've got Chloe in the background um, helping you out there. So the usual advice is to log out and log back in again if anything's not working. Um, if you're on a mobile or tablet, you may need to swipe the screen to the left or right, depending on whether you'd like to see the slideshow or the presenter's camera. So without further ado, I'll move on to the survey results. So in November and December last year, Ruminant Health and Welfare conducted a survey of uh, across four nations of the UK with the aim of establishing the disease, health and welfare priorities of those who work with cats and sheep on a daily basis. The survey saw opinions from stock handlers and farmers, vets and other professionals over the priority diseases from different perspectives, including production efficiency, animal welfare and market access. And for ease going forwards, I'm going to describe those with primary responsibility for animals as farmers and those providing services to farmers as professionals. So in total, the survey yielded 662 usable responses of which 76% were identified as farmers, 34% identified as professionals, and 10% identified as both a farmer and professional. Of the farmers, 81% said they worked with cattle and 54% said they worked with sheep. And again, there was a, an overlap between those that worked with both. And professionals represented the broad range of contributors to animal health and welfare in the UK. But the largest proportion of those who responded to the survey were vets with the majority working with both cattle and sheep. So this next figure illustrates the regional representation of all of the respondents. And overall, all regions were very well represented in the survey, with the largest proportion, around 20%, coming from the southwest of England. The greatest number of beef farmers were located in Scotland, less favoured areas, Wales, less favoured areas, and southwest England. The greatest proportion of dairy farmers were from southwest England and Wales non-LFA. As expected, the largest proportion of hill sheep farmers came from Scotland LFAs, Wales LFAs and the north of England, while the largest proportion of lowland farmers were from southern, southern England, the Midlands and Wales non-LFAs. So in the survey, sheep and cattle diseases were presented for consideration from the perspective of personal and local priorities for farmers and professionals. Respondents were asked to select up to three of these diseases, which in their experience had the greatest impact on the flocks or herds in their locality with particular focus on their impact on productivity and welfare. In a separate question, respondents were asked to do the same from a national perspective, and broader conditions caused by a range of potential factors and commonly associated with particular stages on the production cycle were defined as syndromes. And again, respondents were also asked to select three syndromes they considered to have the greatest impact on production and welfare in their locality. For the top selected uh, diseases and syndromes, respondents were then asked to indicate the scale of this impact on a six point scale ranging from no impact to high. So moving on to the result, 15 sheep diseases were presented for consideration. The first of the top priority sheep diseases identified in terms of impact on production efficiency and animal welfare was foot rot. Professionals rated it especially high, particularly in terms of animal welfare. And in the questions relating to national impact, foot rot was considered to have the greatest impact on industry reputation. When looking at the regional responses, foot rot ranked first and second for all regions. All participant groups also uh, scored contagious ovine digital dermatitis, or COD, as having high impact on animal welfare and a medium high impact on production efficiency. And there were no standout regions with all scoring it high. So all farmer groups and professionals scored sheep scab, liver fluke, and fly strike to be equally high priorities. Sheep scab was considered impactful on both production and welfare at a local level, whilst at a national level, it was considered to have high impact on market access. 
Again, liver fluke was thought to have uh, impact on production and welfare, ranking particularly high in northern and less favoured areas. A difference in scores for production and welfare was observed for fly strike, which was perceived to have a greater impact on welfare. And there was a disparity between farmer and professional responses with this, with farmers scoring higher than professionals. And this disparity is likely due to farmers dealing with fly strike themselves without the involvement of vets, unless in extreme cases. So conversely to this, uh, professionals considered parasitic gastroenteritis higher than farmers, and at a national level, PGE was seen to be more impactful on production efficiency than on market access or industry reputation. So with regards to the other diseases presented in the survey, I just wanted to highlight a few observations. So the next three priorities after those I've just talked about were enzotic abortion, toxoplasmosis and pastorella. MV was not selected by any hill or upland farmers. However, the lowland farmers who selected MV as a priority scored it high impact, particularly at a national level. And most lowland farmers who selected MV were breeding stock producers, and it's possible that their requirement for MV accreditation may have influenced their responses. Another difference of note was that Yoni's disease was perceived to be more impactful on the national flock than at a local or personal level. So in addition to these closed questions, there was also an open question with the option to enter other diseases perceived to be of importance that weren't in the list uh, presented to the respondents. And the most frequently mentioned were trace element deficiencies and border disease. So sheep farmers and professionals were also presented with 12 syndromes for consideration. Neonatal lamb disease or mortality ranked high in all groups for both production efficiency and animal welfare, although professionals scored the impact higher than farmers did. Anthelmintic resistance also ranked high across the groups, but, was, uh, but with a greater perceived impact on welfare. And again, professionals scored the impact higher than farmers. Reproductive failure ranked high in the question relating to production efficiency, particularly by professionals. And for hill farmers, joint ill was ranked a top priority, while fewer people in the other groups selected this as a priority. The impact scores were comparable across all though. For upland and lowland farmers, mastitis was considered a priority, although impact on welfare was perceived to be greater than on production. And while fewer professionals and hill farmers selected it, the impact scores were again comparable. So with regards to the other syndromes presented in the survey, again, I just wanted to highlight the next three priorities after those I've just talked about. And those were ill-thriven lambs, involuntary or premature culling of ewes and flucoside resistance. Ill-thriven lambs were scored more impactful by professionals than farmers. And while a relatively small proportion of respondents selected involuntary or premature culling of ewes as a priority, the impact on production efficiency was scored highly by those who did select it. And regional differences were seen in the impact of flucoside resistance, with Scotland LFAs highlighting this as a priority. So moving on to the cattle disease priorities, 19 cattle diseases were presented for consideration. Digital dermatitis was a priority for all groups, but particularly dairy farmers and professionals, with the impact greater on animal welfare. And at a national level, impact on industry reputation was considered high. At a national level, BVD and Yonis were closely ranked first and second in all groups for impact on production efficiency, market access and industry reputation, with professionals scoring the impact higher than farmers. The impact of BVD ranked slightly higher in England than in the other regions, uh, other nations, sorry. And it's possible that this is a result of the different control methods and schemes in these different uh, nations. Liver fluke was selected by more than double the proportion of beef farmers than dairy farmers or professionals, ranking as their top priority for production on for impact on production efficiency and second for impact on welfare. 
the impact of viral pneumonia on both production efficiency and animal welfare was perceived to be important by all groups, but particularly by professionals. And the next three priorities after those I've just discussed were IBR, uh, Mycoplasma bovis and Cryptosporidia. And is, as with the sheep related questions, in addition to the closed questions, there were open questions to enter other diseases perceived to be of importance. The most frequently mentioned was TB, which obviously has a huge impact on some cattle farms and should without doubt be taken into account in strategy development, but purposefully was excluded from the list of diseases in this survey so as not to detract from identifying other priorities. Um, the others that were identified were trace element deficiencies and dystochia were also frequently mentioned. So moving on to cattle syndromes, 11 cattle syndromes were presented for consideration. Lameness was considered top priority for dairy farmers and professionals with particularly high impact on animal welfare by dairy farmers and beef farmers ranked lameness second with slightly lower impact score. Reproductive failure was ranked second highest for its impact on production efficiency, although impact on animal welfare was a little lower. For all groups, national, uh, neonatal and calf disease was considered to have medium to high impact on animal welfare and was ranked second in this. And professionals scored this particularly high. Acute mastitis was considered a high priority for both dairy farmers and professionals with particularly high impact on animal welfare. The same group scored subclinical mastitis as medium high impact on production efficiency. Profi professionals scored bovine respiratory disease as highly impactful on both production efficiency and on animal welfare. And a much larger proportion of beef farmers than dairy farmers selected this as a priority syndrome. So the next three priorities after those I've just discussed, or the next two, were metabolic disease and involuntary or forced culling of breeding stock. And whilst antibiotic resistance didn't rank particularly high, the disparity between professionals and farmers was notable, with professionals who identified it selecting it as a, a high impact on animal welfare, um, whereas farmers who, who selected it scored it just medium to low impact. So just to summarise, the health and welfare priorities of those who work on the ground with cattle and sheep on a daily basis have been identified by this Ruminant Health and Welfare Survey. The exact priority order of these varied slightly, with some diseases clearly perceived to have a greater impact on animal welfare than on production. There are also differences when respondents were asked to think from a personal perspective versus a national perspective. And it was clear that farmers and vets have some different opinions on priorities and impacts, with professionals generally scoring higher. These differences of opinion may result from farmers visit, um, visiting, from vets visiting numerous farms, so may have a broader range of experience than farmers who may only be able to assess the impact of disease on their own farm. However, it's also possible that vets are only called out to issues that can't be dealt with by the farmer directly. Uh, which could also influence what's seen as the biggest issue by them. So I think it's really important that we recognise and try to understand these differences. Further detail and discussion on these results can be found in the full report, which will be ma made available on Ruminant Health and Welfare's website immediately after this webinar. So I'd like to now hand back to Phil, that so he's going to discuss his observations on the sheep results. Thanks very much. Thank you, Amy, uh, and good morning, everyone. And um, Amy, thank you very much for that presentation and all the number crunching that you've done and the analysis to, to pull together this, um, this report. Um, in my mind, this um, work is a really useful contribution uh, to a lot of ongoing development work on sheep health and welfare. Um, and whichever way you look at it, whether it's from a productivity perspective, um, our environmental footprint, um, our reputation, and even the satisfaction of, uh, of farmers doing the work you know better uh, sheep health and welfare is a win-win situation um, so thank you very much for asking me to give a few observations and perspectives on on, on, on these findings um, some of what I'm going to say now is uh, already covered within the the summary of the report and I'll start by saying that um, 
as with any of this type of work, um, ground truthing is uh, is essential, is crucial. And I guess that's partly what we're doing today is to is to go through um, some of these findings and start to have a discussion with uh, as wide an audience as we possibly can to make sure that we got that ground truthing work really done. Um, Nigel mentioned uh, he talked quite extensively really about syndromes and diseases, and I think we need to. Uh, think really hard about syndromes and diseases. Uh, for example, within the report, uh, neonatal Lyme diseases came out as a top syndrome, and yet none of the neonatal diseases were listed in the top six diseases, which is interesting. Um, it is interesting to think to what extent neonatal diseases um, are, are, are identified at all, and possibly many of them relate to, um, to nutrition and colostrum availability and quality as well. Um, some readers of the report may well question why uh, foot rot and CODD are the top two diseases, yet lameness isn't uh, listed at all as a syndrome. I think that's more um, a, a, a factor of the design of the survey. It's something that we can learn um, from. It's definitely not a criticism of the, of the report or the survey, but simply, again, to make the point that um, ground truthing and thinking through these findings um, is really, really important. Um, similarly, I think you would expect that both categories of respondents, um, uh, farmers and professionals, I don't like the use of that term because I think there's an awful lot of professional farmers out there as well, but I think we all know what we mean by that. But you'd expect both cat categories of respondents to report what they see um, on the farm or what they see reported back to them through um, uh, VICs and, and, and the like. Um, and most of us would accept there is a lot of subclinical disease that affects productivity and welfare. Uh, that doesn't get recognized. An example of the, this would be the iceberg diseases, um, MV, CLA, Yonis, all of which are mentioned within the report. Um, they often hold back optimal performance. Uh, they affect uh, you and lamb long, uh, ram longevity. Uh, they affect cull values, as well as prolificacy and milk yield and another num number of other factors as well. Yet this often goes unidentified and it highlights the need for more and ongoing surveillance and, and monitoring. Um, of what's going on beneath the surface. Uh, Pastorella, I felt, was a very interesting one as well. In this survey, it came out as mid-ranking, um, yet in a recent AHDB fallen stock survey, it showed that Pastorella was the number one killer. Yet that information is very unlikely to, to be fed back to, to the farmer or the vet, and possibly it's no wonder why um, it's, it's, not, it's often not cited or identified. Um, I'm not going to go into any more um, detail of the report. I think Amy's done that admirably well, really. But just to say that probably one of the most sobering findings is uh, that we do have answers to tackling most of the top listed diseases. Foot rot, uh, cod, maybe less so, uh, but um, sheep scab, fluke, fly strike, PGE, all of these things do have answers and solutions. It's maybe less so with um, some of the syndromes, although there are still solutions to many of our neonatal losses. Uh, reproductive failure, anthelmintic resistance, um, even though uh, for us in the sheep sector where we're a very much an extensive sector, uh, environmental factors often come into play. So if we have the answers, where, where is the problem? Well, I think that's not going to be a surprise to anyone listening in today that uh, we know that the biggest problem we have lies in, in getting uptake on the ground or implementing a lot of what we know. Um, and I think we'd be silly to, to, to think that that isn't hard. It's really, really hard to, to, um, to do what you know you should do. And often uh, farmers work to get on top of one problem, just to find that another problem comes around the corner to clobber them shortly afterwards. So I'd suggest that much of what we uh, need to do is about behavioral and conditional change um, throughout all of what all of us do. And I'm not, think, I'm, I'm not thinking it, um, this is about farmers needed to change. I think it's uh, a change for all of us in the support sectors, the veterinary sectors, the uh, laboratory sectors, the research sector, and farmers as well. Um, and to be all working together to put in place a lot of, of what we do know. Um, I think there are a number of things on the horizon that could well help. Um, there are several potentially helpful initiatives just um, uh, in the offing. Um, th this may be contentious, but I would argue that the move away from basic payment over this next four or five years or so will drive change. And although that's going to be challenging for many farmers, I think it will drive change. It will be welcome in the longer term. Um, we have uh, EID within sheep now well embedded, um, farm software on many, many farms as well, benchmarking tools. We know that the uptake take of those services is not uh, maybe as high 
as it should be. And we also know that many people are still using the ID for regulatory purposes, purposes really, rather than a, a, an effective management aid. Um, but we do need to see the uptake, the uptake, greater uptake of some of these tools in order to um, make evidence-based based decisions in the future. Um, most people will be aware of the forthcoming livestock information program in England, and there are similar discussions going on across all devolved nations. And again, it's another area where the Ruminant Health and Welfare Group, with its um, UK-wide reach, I think, can help to influence things. But the LIP and similar approaches will not just improve traceability, but could well, if we get it right, provide a platform for more knowledge-based trading. Um, more knowledge around uh, where stock come from, uh, whether they're part of a, a health assurance scheme, uh, maybe what treatments they've received before they, uh, they're, they're, they're sold as well. So I think the, the LIP could perform a, a really useful platform for us in the future. Um, pathway is another uh, potential um, opportunity in the future as well. And I wouldn't say just Pathway, but the whole uh, group of uh, future farming schemes. And again, I'm talking very much about England here, but there's similar initiatives being talked about in all of our devolved nations. Um, but P Pathway um, looks to looks to be um, like to start with a, a veterinary health and welfare review. And in time, that should um, incentivize farmers to do the right thing. Um, and interestingly, scab, lameness and uh, anthelmintic resistance always come up as key themes when we're talking about the future direction of the pathway uh, scheme as well. Um, this is a bit of a shameless plug, but I'm also going to mention that the uh, National Sheep Association and, and BASIS have just come together uh, to launch a new initiative called ROSA, the Register of Sheep Advisors, in the belief that taking good advice will become more valued in the future, and it will not just inform, but also put some discipline in carrying out the actions um, that, uh, that we know we should be taking. We've got some other great ongoing uh, initiatives um, that have been around for some time, uh, to, to, to name just two, I guess, uh, SCOPS and RUMA. And of course, now the Ruminant Health and Welfare Group, I think, will play a really important part in terms of coordinating, driving and influencing uh, behaviour, and certainly across our developed nations. I'm just going to make two final points, really. Um, firstly, uh, I think genetics are a really key part of, um, of this going forward. And increasingly, we're seeing more holistic breeding and genetic evaluations, and I think we should be welcoming that. I can't help but think that um, in both uh, phenotypical and genotypical evaluations, the rather narrow focus we've had on meat yield or growth rates or head shape or color um, has taken our eye off the ball of real health, robustness, uh, vigor, and longevity. And uh, I think we can welcome um, some of the, the maternal EBV work is going on, and I think we need to see that uh, expanded as well. And then finally, just a comment around gen a, a final comment around general agricultural direction. Um, and uh, you know, we've uh, both in the sheep and the cattle sectors, I guess we've benefit benefited from very high prices over the last um, year. And I think we should recognise the the importance of value. If sheep have a strong value, then farmers will invest, and over time, we may move away from being told to produce things cheaply. A vision of cheapness leads to a lack of respect and, and a culture of cutting costs. Unfortunately, now we're starting to recognize that our future is uh, more one of high standards, high values, and that um, that will do a lot to further the health and the welfare of our national sheep flock. So I think within this report, and hopefully within some of the, uh, the, the analysis that I've done over the last few minutes, it gives us plenty to discuss. And uh, in the meantime, I'll hand over to Colin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil, and good morning, everybody. Um, I would thank you all for the opportunity to just make a few comments on the Newman Health and Welfare Survey. Uh, it is a great opportunity to highlight some of the, the, the key findings from the people on the ground within the industry. Um, getting the perspective of both farmers, vets and other people working on the ground is, is really, really important. Uh, it, it's been really interesting to see how those findings vary slightly between the different groups of people that are involved on farm. Uh, but actually, probably for the cattle sector, they're reasonably well aligned. Uh, and, and we welcome that in that, you know, the people working with farmers, as well as the people doing the farming, the, the, the thinking is reasonably well aligned. Um, our feeling uh, is for cattle 
the disease syndromes are of real, real importance. Um, uh, and it is uh, good to see that these syndromes have been included in the survey. Uh, and uh, it really emphasizes the holistic approach to health planning and management that occurs on farms. Uh, so that we're not you know, specifically looking at specific diseases and specific magic bullets. We're looking at the whole picture of how animals are, are managed the way that they're kept, the way that they're reared and the influence that, that has on disease. So we really welcome the, the fact that we've got disease syndromes in there, uh, but would also highlight as well with this that um, there's pretty good alignment in the cattle findings between some of the individual diseases and the, the syndromes that they form part of. One of the, the, the best examples would be the, the, the findings that the lameness comes out top as a syndrome and, and digital dermatitis comes out top as a, an individual disease. Uh, and the fact that uh, both of these come out top, both in terms of, of farmers, particularly dairy farmers, uh, and, and uh, vets and professionals working with farmers is of, of huge significance. And it, it really highlights the importance of this disease syndrome and this individual disease condition and, and the challenge that that poses to the way that we keep our cows. Hugely important from a welfare point of view, from a, a public perception point of view, but also massively important in terms of, of the productivity uh, impact that this disease has on individual cattle and herds. And, and really underlies, I think, the fact that, that lameness is at the root of a lot of problems. If, if an individual cow is lame, then she is not going to perform uh, as well as she otherwise would. Another example um, would be uh, the linking together of viral pneumonia as individual disease conditions and, and the syndromes of young stock health, neonatal calf disease and bovine respiratory disease. And, and obviously, as we all know, whether we're working in, in beef systems, beef finisher systems or dairy systems, these are all inextricably linked and uh, I think highlights some uh, real challenges that we all know exist uh, in, in minimizing the impact of respiratory disease and some real opportunities as well in, in how we look at how these uh, different um, farming types and these different sectors evolve. Uh, I'm thinking particularly about how we're um, uh, rearing and managing more beef from the dairy herd uh, and also how we manage uh, or calves sold from the suckler herd in terms of how best to limit and minimize the impact of respiratory disease on these production systems, how we not only look at the individual diseases that form part of it, but, but look at how we manage these um, uh, production systems to minimize the impact. Focusing a little bit more on, on individual disease, it's probably no surprise, but, but reassuring and, and good to see how importantly BVD Yoni's disease and liver fluke feature in the individual disease surveys. And again, probably no surprise that liver fluke is highlighted of particular importance for uh, beef and beef suckler systems. Uh, um, we hope that these survey findings in relation to, to BVD um, can act as a, a further piece of evidence and a further drive to demonstrate the need for a, you know, a statutory national control program for BVD eradication in England uh, to match what's going on in the other devolved nations. And, and we hope that one of the findings that comes out of this grassroots survey is, is the impetus to, to kickstart uh, further disease control initiatives for BVD uh, across all of the UK. As with all of these things, um, uh, the survey is great, the survey is all well and good, but it's the challenge really to the industry as a whole, whether that's farmers, uh, vets, researchers, academics, policymakers, whatever, everyone that's involved with the uh, animal agriculture sector in the UK, uh, is, is how we use these survey findings to make a difference, both in terms of national policy, um, reducing the impact on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to highlight what our future research requirements are, what our knowledge gaps are in terms of making progress and what research needs to be commissioned going forwards. But really, most importantly, it's what makes a difference to the farmer on the ground. Uh, and that is critical uh, in, in terms of how it impacts on individual farmers and, and what they can do to make a difference working alongside uh, the, the support team of, of vets and the professionals that work with them. Phil's already highlighted this, but 
there is that well-known thinking that if we used and implemented all of the knowledge that we currently have on all of the disease conditions that we have in the UK, and if we could implement all of that knowledge and all of those control strategies, all of that information on every farm, we would make a massive difference to how we control disease in the UK and also you know, how we manage the production impacts of that disease. Um, and really that is the, the nub of this. It is it's trying to get uh, as much of this done in a practical sense that works for farmers on the ground. And, and we would see that the best farmers working together uh, as part of a, a team on farm is, is the way to do this uh, with other professionals involved as well. And it's a real opportunity uh, through sort of a holistic health planning approach to do this. Um, and it all comes down to what happens at the, the individual farm level and with that team involved on that individual farm. The, the future UK initiatives that will come from government in terms of the animal health pathway and also other similar initiatives that will come forward in the devolved nations will probably help oil the wheels of that process but there's a lot that can be done and is being done with individual farmers and individual teams on the ground there are many national initiatives already in place that can help with a lot of the disease conditions and disease syndromes that have been highlighted in the survey um, uh, so a, a lot of the the, the the knowledge and the schemes are available to help with these things. Um, and examples of this uh, would include um, the BVD Free England initiative and, and similar initiatives throughout the UK, um, the National Yoni's Management Programme, um, AHDB's Healthy Feet Programme, uh, Mastitis Control Plan and Quarter Pro initiatives to help with mastitis, um, and the checks programmes and in particular the, 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 the up and coming checks BTB programs as well. Um, that's not an exhaustive list, but I just put out five, just five examples of initiatives that are already there and in place within UK agriculture to help drive forward the changes that need to be made for some of the conditions that have been highlighted by this survey. And uh, yeah, I think one of the th things that the Rubin Health and Welfare Group needs to do is to help link farmers with their vets and with the teams on the farms to uh, have as much uptake of these schemes and initiatives as possible on the ground uh, and to build on all the good work that's already happening. So there's just a, a few comments from me. I, I would thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more uh, discussion that, that comes out in, in some of the questions and what Nigel is going to say. So I'll hand you back to Nigel to, to sum things up. Uh, thanks, Colin, and thanks, Phil and Amy, for really, uh, I suppose, uh, a quite intensive session, really, of, uh, uh, I suppose, analysis of, of uh, where we are and, and some of the findings of the survey. So it's really appreciated. And I think it highlights the power of our, our steering group. It is probably the, the sort of core of the organisation. Their expertise and energy is what uh, drives the organisation. So uh, thanks to Phil and Colin. Uh, we were, before we move to open session, just a few words about our process, I suppose, to carry this forward. Uh, and uh, what we are planning is to have a, a workshop in, in, uh, in June. This will involve the steering group, but also you know, a range of invited guests who you know, will be pulled from you know, the farming community, from uh, uh, your practicing vets, your farm veterinarians, and also people with particular expertise in epidemiology and disease control. And they are going to be challenged, I think, uh, not to, to immediately look at the barriers and the problems that may arise uh, in, in tackling these diseases. And when I say these diseases or syndromes, it's not just the top three or four or five. It may well be that we want to look a bit uh, deeper than that, uh, where there aren't established initiatives. So, so things like UMV you know, and, and some of the iceberg diseases that uh, Phil mentioned. And I think if we look at the, the, the cattle sector, within the dairy sector as an individual level, Trypsosporidia and, and uh, uh, Neospora came up as an issue. Maybe those are things we should look at as well. So there's, there's quite a depth of, of uh, issues there that the workshop may touch on. Uh, and the real starting point of that will be to ask uh, those attending to look at their ultimate goal you know, pick out the two or three diseases which they think are of uh, real importance 
and say where we should be in five or 10 years time. And just for a few moments, forget about the cost, forget about the cultural change that will have to happen, forget about legislation, forget about the limitations of diagnostics. Where should we be in five or 10 years time? And, and actually we're gonna structure the, the discussions are on that basis. So we've actually got a vision and a goal to go to, and that may not be attainable in five years. It may certainly won't be attainable in many cases today, but the, the role of that workshop will to actually map a pathway that actually may lead us to that ultimate goal. So uh, it's, it's about really being more ambitious than we've been in the past uh, and, and actually trying to break through barriers. And I think there is a, a real role for planning. And if you look at that uh, in the past, that we've been slow to address things. And then when we actually come to address them, the actual infrastructure or, or, or the basics that we need aren't in place. So we've got to start with that. So let, let's get a pathway to these ultimate goals uh, and, and get some energy in, in, in the change process. So, so, so that's the vision for the, uh, for the uh, uh, workshop. It takes place in June. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe quite a few of you listening today, certainly this team group will be involved in that. I think we now go to open questions. And I think there's one immediately from, uh, for a comment from Lorraine Lucia on Sheepscab. Uh, and uh, I think there's then one queuing up from Mike Bardsley, which is a cattle question. But we'll go to Lorraine first. I'm not getting Lorraine, but Lorraine's question was really about uh, uh, the challenges of sheep scab on, on hill areas and, and complete gathering, the, the need, requirement for a complete gathering, which obviously gets even more problematic with open marches. Uh, uh, Phil maybe wants to talk about that. It's, it's basically sheep scab and, and how do we really get to grips with it? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nigel, and uh, thanks for the the question, Lorraine, as well. I mean, you you highlight a really important point, and I think the answer to this, again, that we're trying to address is around coordination. It's around trying to make sure that there is some uh, ne uh, regional, well, local, regional, and national coordination around dealing with scab. You know, how many times do you hear that um, someone's uh, uh, got scab, they 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 treat it, they control it, and then if they're in a common situation, their sheep go out and they pick it up again. And so, and that's really why um, the, the the recent uh, RDPE uh, sheep scab, uh, I think we call it for flock sake. I'll be careful how you say that, but for flock sake, let's let's get it under control or something. But um, uh, that that's really why that whole program is built very much on on, on coordination and trying to pull farmers together to, to work in a collaborative um, uh, manner. That issue of um, uh, maybe shooting sheep on site that are uh, uh, feral, they become feral sheep. I think it's a really um, serious question. Personally, I'd have no objection with that. I know of several cases where there are uh, a, a feral sheep population living within or on the edge of forestry areas within common land, and they're a, a real problem. And that's another example where there needs to be some coordinated activity to, to do proper gathers and to deal with those uh, feral sheep, whether they can be gathered and then disposed of or whether they they need to be shot on site. Personally, I wouldn't see that as a welfare problem as long as it's all, all, all done properly. But you know, unless we deal with some of these things in a serious fashion, they're just going to keep coming back time and time again. Yeah, thanks, Phil. And it's certainly a, a major challenge. And I think uh, there have been initiatives in some regions that are looking at that sort of approach and in, in, in gathering and, and even with the forestry authorities for, for coming out to uh, uh, rogue sheep in, in, in uh, plantings. The, the, the next question, I think, is really one focused at uh, uh, Colin. It's about syndromes, and the, from Mike Bardsley, it would have been useful to separate and highlight the impact of young stock disease and mortality, not just uh, neonatal, from both welfare and economic viewpoint. I think, to a degree, the survey does that a bit, but maybe Colin would like to comp uh, comment on that. I think you'll have the question. Yeah. I would certainly uh, agree with with Mike's point on, firstly, in general terms, just how important this whole issue of, of, of young soul disease is. Uh, it, it doesn't just focus on the neonatal period immediately. It is, you know, right through um, uh, the, the rearing period and particularly the early months of the rearing period. But but that's you know measured in 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 a, in a in months rather than weeks, if you see what I'm saying. So uh, th there is some information, I think, deep within the survey that does highlight 
the importance of that. But I think the other point that Mike really brings out is is the knock on impact that that has on uh, older cattle, uh, be that adult dairy cattle, if we're breeding your replacement heifers, or um, uh, the impact that that might have on time to finish uh, and you know production efficiency in uh, beef finishing systems. Um, so I would absolutely agree that the whole area is of, of, of huge importance in terms of driving efficient animal production uh, and um, you know, minimizing the knock-on impacts that that will have and does have on, on older cattle as well as younger cattle. So I think that probably is something that we can develop and bring out further, uh, whether that's through Rumen Health and Welfare Group or you know, as a wider industry, because it, it's, a, it's an issue that we all recognize. Thanks. Uh, another question from Jonathan King, and this is really focused on EMR and, and antelmintic resistance. And I think he has real concerns that uh, you know that didn't figure more highly in the survey, uh, uh, and that the concerns weren't really expressed. And he's asking, is this because it's an, uh, not an issue because we're already addressing it, or is it just that awareness is very low, or understanding is low? And I, you know, I think that probably uh, you know maybe Colin would like to start, but I think. Phil's views would be of value as well. Thanks. I think AMR is is an interesting one as far as this survey is concerned, um, and it, it certainly does come out in the survey. Um, and I, I would highlight two things really from from the cattle side of things. Uh, um, it's probably a bigger picture thing for a lot of uh, uh, you know of the wider industry in general. Uh, in that you know, we're we're trying to manage our medicines responsibly uh, as part of uh, good practice, responsible farming, and the bigger picture issues, the bigger societal issues on on how we uh, you know limit the the development of anthelmintic resistance and and how that goes forward. Um, but I would also highlight that you know in the last five years there have been been huge changes that have been made in uh, how antibiotics are prescribed and how antibiotics are used on farm um, uh, in, in all sectors um, and uh, you know farmers have embraced that really really well uh, you know we talk about behavioral change and uh, you know this has been in a real area where there has been a lot of behavioral change already that's not to say that there's more work to do but that there has a lot that has been achieved in terms of how, how medicines are used and prescribed on farm now and, and more work to be done so I, I think it is a wider issue that we all have to buy into as an industry I'll maybe let Phil comment a little bit more on on the anthelmintic resistance uh, issues as they well they, they do relate to cattle as well but but particularly how they relate to sheep mm. thanks Colin I, I I think this is another one of those issues where um, you know the survey very much um, asked questions about what people were seeing on their farms and they often don't see this it's one of those uh, you know these are they're not necessarily subclinical things, but they're they're, they're not necessarily visually um, uh, easy to see. So I think that's possibly the reason why the survey didn't pick it up as being more important on an industry scale. There's no doubt that both um, AMR resistance and, and possibly within the sheep sector, um, you know, anthelmintic resistance is being seen on a strategic level as absolutely crucially important going forward. Um, but I, I guess on a farm level, people often don't identify that or see that. And I think, you know, Scops, I know, has got a, a really useful initiative plan to, to, uh, to, to, to work on going forward to try to uh, get more of a handle on the level of anthem resistance that we've got and, uh, and to try to tackle it. It's one of those issues, isn't it, where really anthem resistance to either the group one, two, and sometimes all three um, wormer groups at the moment, we're starting to see resistance to all three on some farms. And we see them in small numbers. And again, on an industry scale, we talked about them quite a lot. But individual farmers don't necessarily ever get to to experience that problem or to see it so and i think it, it, it's another issue where communication and more co coordination and and these are words that it's really difficult to get uptake on the farm but strategic action coordinating that action collaboration we all know that's where our future is going to be and it is again about um, f um communication and uh and, and trying to get more uptake on the ground really but these are serious problems that um, may not be affecting everyone today, but if we don't tackle them soon, they're going to affect more people in the years ahead. 
Yeah, thanks, Phil and Colin. Um, I think this is maybe as a slight feature of the, the, the this sort of survey in that uh, if you delve down into it and you look at the opinions at sort of regional level uh, or, or the, the types of farms, antelmitic resistance in, in, in uh, you know in low ground and fairly intensive sheep farms comes up as quite a significant priority, but not so on hill farms. And, and that isn't maybe too surprising given the parasitic pressures in different systems. So I think that, that, that you, you, we've really got to delve down into the uh, uh, into the survey a bit to actually appreciate you know what opinions really are. And again, triclobendazole resistance for low ground farms and probably farms on the east side of the country is not an issue. Uh, but if you actually delve down into some of the LFA areas, there is actually a significant response about flucoside triclobendazole resistance. So I think that is there on antimicrobial resistance. You know maybe. Uh, um, you know, maybe we should be more have a higher uh, uh, response rate on that. Uh, in reality, you know, snapshot surveys that have been done in Scotland, just in small numbers, looking at resistance uh, or drug resistance in, in sheep mastitis, have actually shown very, very low levels of resistance uh, in treating sheep mastitis. So, you know, there are areas where, you know, the actual antimicrobial use is actually quite light. Uh, in the ruminant sector, and we're not getting or, or, or resistance into feature. So I think it's something we've really got to keep an eye on, but we've got to understand the, the regional and the, se the, the sectoral dynamics. There's another question here about, uh, um, or a comment here about tick-borne diseases, which you know, really haven't uh, uh, featured highly. Um, in reality, we've got another work screen going on, which is about uh, low prevalence but high impact diseases. Which really captures you know, uh, uh, tick issues in that they are confined to certain areas, and, and in in a Four Nations national survey, tend not to be come up as a major priority. So, so that that different approach is capturing uh, 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 the, the tick sector. So that that's a, a quick response to Nick Hart who raised that that gap. And from the Scottish farmer, we've got uh, Patsy asking about OPA uh, or Yagsiti, uh, and I think again delving down into the survey. Uh, your OPA is there, Yagsiti, and certainly you're speaking to uh, farmers uh, uh, or listening to farmers. It is a real issue in some regions, uh, without a doubt, and, and uh, as is MV. And again, if you dig into the survey, there's slight differences uh, at different regional levels. Uh, it's there about number 10. And, and you know, uh, uh, if, if we actually look at number 10, that is actually quite a high score for an iceberg disease. And I think that you know, when you go down below the top five, we have several diseases like that clustering around, which I suppose there's a bit of a warning there. They're there. If we don't do something about them, uh, if we don't aren't proactive, they're going to creep up the uh, up the scale, or they may do. So I think that the, the OPA is covered, and there is a reflection there. I think of the reality of the risk, uh, just like there is for MV uh, and other other uh, iceberg diseases. The real gap in the survey is border disease, and I think it's probably my fault in living in a silo, in a Scottish silo, where border disease isn't rated as, as a significant factor uh, in, in many areas. It was left out. It should have been in there, and I apologise for that. And that, that comment came back in, in, in the survey in, 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 the, in the window. Uh, hopefully that maybe answers uh, uh, Patsy's Comments. I don't know whether Phil or Colin wants to make any comment about yeah. ice diseases in the PA. I'd, well, I'd love to make a, a general comment about that, and that is that um, you know often within the, the sheep sector, you know we've looked at the we've looked for that silver bullet, you know which is the disease that we need to tackle to solve our problems. And I think what this report has, uh, has shown is that there there is a very wide uh, spectrum of diseases and syndromes, and they will be different um, on different farms in different parts of the country and. It's really, it's been, I think it always has been, and it remains really difficult to think this is the area we've got to focus on. I and mean, I think where we've arrived is that the area that we should be focusing on is trying to really build that um, vet in an advisory capacity and farmer relationship to identify the problems on, the, on, on that individual farm within that individual area, maybe, and tackle what's important for, for the individual. Um, you know, none of these diseases in isolation affect everyone. And it is that interrogation into the farm itself and then the ability to maybe focus on what's really important for that farm and that system. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, a quick comment, Colin? Or... I think perhaps 
one of the differences, and I, I would agree with what Phil says on the on the sheep side, in that you know that particular disease or disease syndrome might be very impactful on one farm, and and you know far less so ten miles down the road. Um, uh, if I could make a comparison to some of the the things that have scored really highly in the cattle side of this, and and I accept also that that there are individual diseases that will affect individual herds, but you know, for example, lameness, mastitis, fertility um, are you know challenges for from all farms in 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 quite significant ways very often. So uh, you know. The, the, it's much more universal. Some of the big priorities that have come out of this, I think, are much more more, more universal and, and can make a difference in quite a, a, a bigger proportion of farms. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, really, I suppose going back to uh, uh, an area that you have particular interest in, uh, Colin, this is from uh, Alistair Cook and uh, Sarah Davis. Uh, and these were separate questions, but they, they, they had a similar thrust. And it was really, I suppose, concerns about slow progress on lameness uh, 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 and wondering whether retailers had a role in actually rewarding uh, you know, uh, hard managers or, or uh, I suppose suppliers who actually make progress on lameness uh, with, with, with premiums. Is, is, is that, that going to be a, a useful driver? Uh, I'll give that to Colin. Absolutely and, and, and yes it already is a, a driver for for farmers. Um, uh, I'm just reading the the, the the comments and the questions in the text on this. And uh, I mean, yes, we have to accept, and, and this survey reinforces this, that, that lameness is still an issue, uh, a significant issue on dairy farms. Uh, and you know, we're being open and honest about that. It's good that that's recognised by by farmers and vets. And you know, that's that's a good starting point to do something about it. Um, uh, yes, uh, the customers, supermarkets, retailers, the customers at large are demanding ever higher standards. That that is absolutely the right thing, um, and and that is correct. But but it's not just them that need it from a sort of a welfare perspective and from a societal benefit. The the real benefit comes on the farm uh, for the individual animal uh, or animals affected and also for the, the overall productivity of that farm. So uh, we need to see it in that context, I think, is, is, is the difference that can be made on a farm by reducing lameness prevalence. Um, there are lots of things going on. We accept, I think, that there is a lot of work to do, uh, but you know, there are lots of things going on. If we think about the register of mobility scorers, that is, is now giving us a more uniform way of assessing the levels of lameness on our farms so that we can actually you know now not only work out what the starting point is on farms but assess progress which is you know something that we've not been able to do in a standardized way until recent years uh, on a wide uptake scale and, and certainly the supermarket contracts and the, the milk contracts have helped with that um, uh, and there is a lot of initiatives that can help with we are looking not just at the levels of lameness that are there but looking at uh, the you know how how to manage it, how to reduce it, how to, to to make progress. So there are lots that can be done. There is lots of help available. Uh, there is a fantastic network of accredited foot trimmers that can help with this as well. So there are the building blocks in place to do this. There are some great examples of some farms that have made huge strides, but that is not to say that there is uh, still a. a a significant amount of work that needs to be done as to you know how retailers pay for this and and, and everything else is probably the, the beyond the scope of what i should be qualified to talk about but uh, i think we need to view this as well what are the genuine benefits for your own herd for your own cows and and and, and it will deliver wins no question thanks uh we're running over time but uh, that's the story of my life so we're, we're going to actually look at uh, uh you know, two more questions and then I think we probably should close. The first one of those is from Gavin Watkins and it really comes in two parts. One, one's a comment really emphasizing the importance of surveillance systems and, and the, you know, the, the role that livestock keepers have in, in actually, and vets I suppose, in engaging and contributing to those. And uh, I guess also a plea that, that maybe your food chain information uh, from uh, abattoirs can be you're better transmitted back to to uh, uh, to producers. So 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 that that's one area which is much really much a comment. But he has a, a really interesting question. 
And he's wondering if it's useful to determine the dis or distinguish between those diseases that can and should be dealt with at farm level and those that require wider coordination and effort. Uh, so uh, I think he, he comments about some of the things that are happening in Wales. But I think the core of that, should we actually be dividing up diseases in those that should be tackled at a farm level and those that require a, a regional or a national approach? Uh, I'll give Collins a quick rest and go to Phil, and no doubt he'll give you a good five-minute rest, OK? <laughs> I'm not going to give you a five minute. I can keep this really short because I fully agree. I mean, I think that we need to do both. It, 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 we probably are already uh, dividing them, but uh, not in a, a formal way. I think it might be quite an interesting exercise to do that, really. Um, I think it's essential that we're picking up uh, problems on individual farms. And it's also essential that, if, that we start to feed that information into a national a hub, if you like, to, to, to try to get a, both a national picture and for that to be broken down into regions as well, because there will be regional and local differences here. So I would just say yes, you know, and it does, it highlights again the importance of um, of that individual uh, farm visit and, and, and more investigation uh, into what's going on farm, but also building up that national picture through more surveillance and, and monitoring. And I probably have taken five minutes and I apologise for that, Colin. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, three comments really. Um, all, you know, everything needs to be tackled at the farm level. That's the first thing. Um, and you know, the, every farm will be will have its own unique set of circumstances. So, local knowledge uh, and, uh, and and the vet farmer partnership is absolutely crucial there. I think hopefully, I would see a role for the Rumen Health and Welfare Group, and this survey kickstarts it as to open up discussions about what else needs to be sorted out at a national level, you know, whether it's sheep scab, whether it's BBD, whether it's other areas uh, where there could be more national uh, initiatives and incentives to do things. And I think really that's, you know, the conversations that need to be had at the workshop later on in June. Um, and, you know, hopefully then that can feed right the way up to, uh, you know, industry bodies and policymakers to actually enact that. Um, if I can make one final comment on surveillance, then it's absolutely critical. Uh, and, it, it, you know, there are obviously lots of different ways that surveillance can be done, uh, but it gives us the baselines of what's going on what's changing in terms of the endemic diseases and also what might be coming down the tracks in terms of new and emerging diseases. So in the full gamut of different ways that surveillance can be done, which absolutely starts at the farm, uh, then, and with farmers, then, you know, we need to consider how that's done so that we can, you know, really assess how things are going in the future, how we're progressing and what else is coming to trouble us. Thanks. Uh, one final question, and apologies if I mispronounce the name. Yan Li Du, um, his question or her question is uh, about the DEFRA pathway. Uh, and uh, do you believe that uh, uh, the DEFRA pathway will play a big role in driving change? And that's the final question. Phil, I'll let you start, and then we'll go to Colin, and then I'm afraid we're out of time. We'll close. Yeah. Well, just very quickly, I, I think it, it, in England, I think that's as far as the pathway programme extends to. But hopefully, again, uh, we'll see similar initiatives elsewhere. But I think um, the pathway programme could um, engender a real change. But I wouldn't just look at pathway in isolation. I think that we've got to look at the whole suite of future farming schemes because um, improved health and welfare will have a, an impact on, on productivity, on our environmental footprint, um, on our landscapes. Um, and, and on the, the, the health and welfare of animals. It has a huge impact on our reputation and building trade. So somehow we've got to try to integrate uh, health and welfare across all the different interest areas uh, within uh, the, the, the policy world. And I do think Pathway has the potential over time to, um, to really influence things. Colin? I think potential is the key word, really. I think the animal health pathway for England has the potential to drive change, no question. Uh, and you know, we're in a different era in terms of support for farming and how that's delivered. So it has a lot of potential. I think you know, it's due to start next year and we'll start small, no doubt, and grow. And that's the nature of these things. And it's gonna be down to the industry to help influence how that grows. So there is potential. 
And the only other thing I would say is, you know, it, it, it's not just uh, the English side of things, it's how this develops in the devolved nations as well. Um, and, and what uh, schemes, pathways, models that are developed in, in, in other parts of the country to help drive change and, and, and support these initiatives. So it's, it's an interesting time, it's a great opportunity and it has a lot of potential and we just need to, as an industry, make sure that we could realise that. Thanks. Amy, would you like to, to, to make any sort of observations or comments on, on uh, the dialogue or, 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 or the feedback we've had from the survey? That's a, a, a bit of an unfair question, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, just to say that the report is available on the Ruminant Health and Welfare website now after this webinar, um, and there's a lot more discussion in there and a lot more detail around um, the exact uh, scores that were given by the professionals and farmers. So if you want to go and take a look, that's available now on the Ruminant Health and Welfare website. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, any you thing we've missed, Phil or Colin, or, or do you think we've, we've uh, with Amy's comments, we've actually done it all? I think we could keep this going for another hour, but we probably yeah. didn't want to. But no, I don't think I've got anything else to add just at this I think, stage. I think we've done it all. So we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll close with that. Many thanks to, to Amy, especially for all the work and for your fantastic presentation. To Colin and Phil for their observations and comments, which have actually fueled the debate. And, and for all of you for joining us and for your questions, which I think have really you know, highlighted some really important areas. Uh, as Amy said, th this slide shows our, our uh, uh, web address. You can uh, go there to get an immediate uh, copy of the report. In the next 24 hours, if you register, uh, both the report and the, the press release will be available to you by email. And by Monday, we're hoping to have a Q&A on the RHW website, website, which will kind of reflect the questions that were asked today, uh, but also may, may try and fill some of the gaps that we, we think we may have left. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a real flavour of, uh, uh, I suppose, the real views of those on the ground uh, and the implications they have maybe for the future. Thanks very much for your time and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.